Good evening. You guys must have thought somebody else was preaching. I'm looking out here. I got quite a crowd here. But very good to see everybody. Now, Curtis Allen, he has uh, a couple of times recently, he's talked about the elders' desire for 2017 to uh, reemphasize evangelism. And so I'm just getting a jump on things. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Now, much, much to Brother John's chagrin, I'm not going to begin with in conclusion, <laughs> but we're going to get there quickly, so be encouraged. Now, non-Christians, they sometimes dislike the fact that Christians try to persuade them to become Christians. They have the idea that Christians should keep to themselves, you know, not push their religion on other people, but of course they feel free to push an anti-Christian agenda on us 24-7. Now that's a topic for another sermon, but uh, I want to say a little bit this, this afternoon about Christian evangelism. More specifically, I want to talk about the three great truths on which evangelism is founded. <laughs> And the first truth on which evangelism is founded is that God's passion is that all people be saved. God intensely desires that mankind be reconciled to Him. Luke chapter 15, text you know well. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I'd lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You see, lost sinners, friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, they are of great value to God. Just like the lost sheep and the lost coin of, are of great value to their owners as evidence in their rejoicing. See, when they find them again, they're very valuable to them. When they find them, they're extremely happy about it. And see, the fact they are lost does not diminish their importance. See, the fact they're lost doesn't diminish their importance. They don't cease to count because they're lost. The sheep that's lost doesn't cease to count. So they say, so what? I found it. I've already blown that one off. He was lost. The coin's lost. I don't care about it. It's lost. They continue to be of value. And you see that in the rejoicing that's there. Now this concept of God's longing for people, it is beautifully expressed in Thomas Kelly's adaptation of a poem by Francis Thomas. And Kelly writes, History ultimately is the drama of of the hound of heaven baying relentlessly upon the track of men. It is the drama of the lost sheep wandering in the wilderness, restless and lonely, feebly searching, while over the hills comes the wiser shepherd, for his is a shepherd's heart, and he is restless until he holds his sheep in his arms. It is the drama of the eternal father drawing the prodigal home unto himself, where there is bread enough and to spare." See, this is why God sent His Son into the world. 
As Jesus says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Some translations say, what was lost? Everyone who is lost is valuable to God. He wants them all to be found. As Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what God wants. He's passionate about uh, he's passionate about all people. He's the, that's his passion that they be saved. So that is the first pillar. The first great truth of Christian evangelism is that God's passion is that all people be saved. The second great truth is that God's plan requires the spreading of a message. You see, it requires the spreading of a message. Lost people, which is all people, they must hear and accept the message of God's work in Christ in order to be saved. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 25, Peter reminds his Gentile brothers and sisters that they had been born anew, they had been born into the family of God by means of the message that had been preached to them. He says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, resulting in genuine brotherly love, love one another fervently from a pure heart, having been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached as good news to you. See, so God is passionate that all people be saved, but this involves conveyance of a message. That is how God operates and what he does, the Apostle Paul's equally clear about that. He says, for the scripture says, no one who believes on him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same one is Lord of all, being rich toward all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one in whom they did not believe? And how can they believe on one whom they did not hear? How can they do that? The answer is they can't. On one they did not hear, and how can they hear without one preaching? And how can they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how welcome are the feet of those proclaiming good news of good things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. In criticizing Jewish interference, Paul states that his purpose in speaking to the Gentiles about Jesus was that they might be saved. He says, for you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea, because you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, who drove us out, who displeased God, and who are opposed to all people, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Speaking to the Gentiles, message to them, a word is given to them. And that is how God has arranged this. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, Paul declares that it's through the gospel that God calls people to salvation. But we'd, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because God chose you the first fruit for salvation by sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. For this purpose, He called you through our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He called them through the gospel. Now, we have to fight to hold on to this truth. We really do. There are voices, see, that suggest that, well, people will be saved by being good. That's how you'll be saved. You just be, you know, we'll take a poll and we'll have people say, no, 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 he's a great guy. Just a really good guy. Uh, ask anybody. I mean, ask his co-workers. Ask anybody. He's a really good guy. And we have this idea and this notion out there that if you're a good person, quote, 
that you're going to be just fine. In other words, if you live a good enough life, you'll be, resa- you'll be saved regardless of whether you, ex- you ever accepted the gospel. That's this idea, and that idea is not true. It is simply not true. Now, our pluralistic, relativistic culture rejects the notion that there is one way to God. See, far too many people in our society, in our world, would choose Gandhi's assessment of Christ over that of the Bible. Gandhi said the soul of religions is one, but it is encased in a multitude of forms. I cannot ascribe exclusive divinity to Jesus. He is as divine as Krishna or Rama or Muhammad or Zoroaster. You see, and that's that philosophy. It's so seductive because it's packaged as praise to God. You see, it's, it's the idea of you're, you're limiting God. God is so big. See, he's too big to be confined by the gospel. Too big to be limited to one way of reconciliation. You see, it's, it's very seductive. It's packaged as, no, my God's just bigger. You just have the small God. So that's part of the way that, that, you know, he's just too big for that. Well, Jesus said, as you well know, in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If there's a statement that our world hates, I'm nominating that one at the top. I'm nominating that one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts Acts 4, 12 you see, Peter, he, makes, he preaches this truth to the Sanhedrin. He says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus. And we could look at other texts. First John. You know, you don't, know, you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. It's, it's just there. It's God is reconciling us through what He did in Jesus Christ, and that message is something that we need to speak. It involves this idea, you see. So God is the bottom line is that if people are to be saved, the gospel has to be preached. The gospel has to be presented. We can't sit here and say, well, I just think, you know, maybe this guy will get a lightning bolt or something. It has to be presented to them. We have to do that. The third And you'll be glad to know final truth. The third and final truth that is the foundation of evangelism is that so we have God's passion is that all people be saved. God's plan requires the spreading of a message. And the third is that God's people are His instruments for carrying out His plan. As I think of this, these are the pillars of evangelism. That God is passionate about people. He wants them reconciled. That His plan for doing this requires the spreading of a message. And the people who are to spread that message are the saints. We are the ones who are to do that. Again, you see this in Romans 10, 11 through 15, the text that we looked at. Paul asks some very revealing rhetorical questions there. See, he says, And how are they to believe in one of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they're sent? See, who's doing this? Who is proclaiming this message? It is people in the church, the redeemed, who are going out on behalf of God the Father and sharing the message with the lost world that he's so passionate about having reconciled to him. We are His children doing His bidding because He wants people to be saved. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, called the Great Commission. Jesus there, He addresses the apostles, but He does so in their their role as disciples. See, they're, they're paradigms for all disciples. And He says, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is our charge. 
1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 11, 1. Paul says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Be not a stumbling block to Jews, to Greeks, or to the church of God, even as I also try to please all men in all things, not seeking my own advantage, but the advantage of many, so that they may be saved. What's he doing here? I'm trying to please all men so that they may be saved. All men in all things. I'm interested in pleasing them. Why? So that I might be an instrument of their salvation. I might speak on God's behalf to them so that they might accept the gospel message and be reconciled with God because my God is passionate about having them reconciled to him. And then he says, be imitators of me. Who is he talking to? I'm this way. Now you be imitators of me as I also am of Christ. So that we are God's designated agents for the spreading of this message that is essential for the reconciliation about which he is so passionate. So we are the people who are to be doing that. You think of the conversions in the book of Acts. They happened as Christians preached the message. I mean, even Cornelius, the devout centurion, he didn't reason his way to saving knowledge. He didn't have that knowledge given to him directly by God. God sent Peter to him to preach. Why doesn't he just zap people? Why doesn't he just put the knowledge in their head? You can ask him that. But I'm telling you what he has said and what he's revealed, how he's done this. And he's done this that he calls us to go and speak, to share that message with other people. Now you might wonder about the deeper question, you know, of why God entrusted us with fulfilling his plan. But we can't let that question obscure the fact that he has. He has entrusted us. Alan Richardson, he's a, a New Testament scholar from a prior generation, he summarizes the New Testament's teaching on this point, and he says the New Testament stresses the fact that the church had received from her risen Lord a renewed command to be his witnesses under the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1.8, and to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28.19. The missionary preaching of the church was to continue until the consummation of the age. So you and I have something to be about. Now, as Christians, we are obligated to spread the gospel. See, God is passionate about the lost, and he's given us the responsibility of sharing the message of life with him. Our job is to plant and water, and God will do with it what he will. He will do with it what he will. But that is what we are to be about as Christians. Is that the be all and end all? Is that all of our... No, you understand the depth and breadth of the Christian life. But what we can't sweep under the rug is the call to share the message of Christ with people, with a dying world. And the world intimidates us and threatens us so that we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to upset somebody. who will say, oh, you know, I found that offensive. Well, what are we going to do? So you're going to say something, oh, you can't say that. Are we going to talk to people about Jesus? You see, that's the call. And I'm through.